The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, colleagues, and welcome to our consultation warm-up uh, webinar, which is live and is being recorded so that we can give that uh, to, to those folks who aren't able to join us this afternoon. The consultation warm-up uh, webinar is, of course, for the Initial Teacher Education Inspection Framework. My name is David Storey. I'm one of Her Majesty's Inspectors and the Specialist Advisor at Ofsted for Initial Teacher Education. I'm joined by a couple of colleagues that will shortly introduce themselves, but first I just wanted to provide a bit of background as to the purpose of the webinar. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of you will know that we had planned, in fact, to hold uh, some face-to-face -face, uh, warm-up uh, events prior to the consultation uh, around the, the beginning of December 2019. Obviously, events uh, rather uh, you know, caught us out there, and uh, the, with the pre-election silence period or PERDA, we had to cancel those events. Uh, we, we hope that this live webinar will be a suitable alternative to share with you the direction of travel that, that, that's being undertaken uh, and the development of a new IT inspection framework as we head towards the consultation period. As promised in the communications that we sent to you about this webinar, as I said earlier, we are recording it and a copy will be available for you to, to listen to, as well as for those folks who aren't able to, to join us this afternoon. So, uh, just uh, an overview of uh, this afternoon's uh, session. Uh, we are uh, looking at uh, the IT inspection framework as it is today. We're going to give you a context for change. Um, we've got a colleague from research who will introduce themselves in a minute, uh, who's going to lead you through looking at uh, some of the findings from Ofsted's research into the IT curriculum. We'll be talking a little bit about the pilots that we've undertaken, general engagement, and then we'll be looking forward to what you might expect the proposed uh, consultation framework to perhaps begin to look like. And we'll be, uh, before we, we wrap up and take questions, we'll be looking at the ITT uh, core content framework, which was, of course, published by the DFE uh, just prior to Perda. Um, before we do, um, I will uh, just pause and allow my, my two colleagues to introduce themselves. Uh, we've uh, got Richard. Good afternoon, colleagues. My name is Richard Light. I'm a senior HMI uh, based in the southwest. Um, I work across remits in schools, FE, and in teacher training. Um, I'm responsible for overseeing the quality of uh, training and of uh, inspections of uh, IT providers within the Southwest region. Thank you, Richard. Alan? Uh, hi there, colleagues. Uh, my name's Alan Passenham. I'm the, one of the senior research leads in Ofsted's research and evaluation team, uh, and I led the IT curriculum research that we'll go through in a little while. That's great. Thank you, Alan. And before we progress, I should just say that if you've got any questions, uh, we've had the questions that were posed uh, when you were registering for the uh, for the webinar. We'll go through some of those um, at the end of the session. If since then other things have occurred to you or you didn't ask a question then and you'd like to uh, propose one as we, we progress through, there is a question box within the webinar system that you can put them, uh, type them into. And we will uh, take uh, a number of them uh, before we finish the webinar. If you're having difficulties with sound or any other technical diff difficulties, a colleague Lillian is around, please pop that in, in a question in the question box and, and Lillian uh, will get to you and give you one-to-one -one help uh, via, via text, um, instant messaging. So the IT framework as it is today, uh, Richard. Thank you, David. Um, colleagues, I'd like to just start really about how um, our changes into the proposed framework fit in with the corporate strategy that Ofsted has been working through since 2017. This marked a significant change in emphasis with much more resource and investment going in towards research and um, a time for inspectors to actually go out and retrieve evidence and find out what was working, what wasn't working in our current inspection practice, 
and to build on particular theories of actions to ensure that our new frameworks are founded firmly and rooted in the evidence that we've, we've gathered. Uh, the theories of actions was applies when we formulated and consulted and, and devised the education inspection framework for schools. And we are now applying that same delivery to the new ITE inspection framework. So we wanted to ensure that inspection and research evidence was firmly at the root and at the heart of any new framework that was being devised, which is why the research team at Ofsted have set up programmes to focus on the ITE curriculum specifically. I don't know Alan will talk later in greater depth about the presentation of the research and some of the findings that were published recently. We wanted also to ensure that the inspection process evaluated the quality of teacher education and the training against the evidence of what made effective training and education with a particular aim of moving away from outcomes data which has been at the heart of the school framework as well. We also wanted to ensure that our reporting as an end product to our inspections enabled users and other relevant bodies to make informed decisions and to encourage improvement amongst ITE partnerships. School and FE reports have been dramatically changed under the education inspection framework. And we recognise that there is a different audience for ITE um, reports going forward. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Um, and just uh, now moving into our offset corporate strategy, when we began looking at this uh, some time ago, in, uh, at the end of 2018, beginning to sort of look forward and plan out how we were going to move forward to the consultation period, uh, offset had just begun its new corporate strategy. And you'll see in blue at the top there, that that is Ofsted's main guiding principle for all of our work, not just for ITE. There's this this aim to be a force for improvement for 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 the systems that we work with and inspect through intelligent, responsible, and focused inspection and regulation. And you will see that that then breaks down into some core values about about our, about our work, and then uh, some uh, strategic approaches and. What, what we are trying to do here with this new framework is uh, HMCI commissioned the research, which we'll come back to later with Alan, but that was really to inform the work that we were doing and the work that we, we've been piloting to make sure that the, the, the new framework overall is based on solid evidence both through, through research and through piloting and engagement with the sector to make sure that, we, that we're clear that we think we've got the most valid and reliable inspection practice we possibly can. Responsible, uh, we want to be clear uh, about what we're doing, that's why we, we've tried to engage uh, and certainly the piloting programme that we, we've had is the most extensive in Ofsted's history for ITE prior to the launch of any of our previous frameworks and that's to make sure that we hear from you uh, as much as possible as we shape our, our new processes and inspection framework, but also to identify what potential misconceptions may have developed over time, some of which we may have caused or may have been uh, as a result of uh, you know, a range of things within the educational landscape. Uh, but we want to make sure that we're absolutely clear about what the expectations of this framework will be. And, and, and as we go through launching and move into delivery of this framework that we continue to keep that within our sites. Focus, we want to be really focused in our work so that we are prioritising as we, we move out into uh, the, the new framework when the, when the draft consultation document comes out and you see the draft handbook, you'll see that there is uh, the clear risk assessment criteria for, uh, for, for that. That's got to be signed off by the executive board, but we are going to try to prioritise who and how we're inspecting, and also uh, within there, uh, again, subject to being signed off and then subject to consultation, we are looking to develop, uh, rather than coming out and doing those monitoring visits for phonics and behaviour, having a look at some ungraded and uh, uh, more formative evidence gathering around subjects provision within uh, ITE that can contribute to Ofsted's work you may know that Ofsted is in the process of recruiting uh, subject leads for a whole raft of subjects 
um, so that we have subject experts within the organization of national quality. Um, and uh, the idea is that those, those, those monitoring visits will be developmental for, for the IT uh, uh, partnership, but also to make sure that rather than it being a one-off event, that those can feed into uh, wider subject reports nationally, perhaps in the way that we used to see uh, in days gone by. So, uh, where are we now? Well, I mean, you, you, you'll all be very well aware that the current framework has uh, been in place since 2012, and we uh, had uh, an extension year last year. We did some more uh, constrained inspections during uh, the, uh, 2019. Those have obviously all come to an end, um, and we, uh, you know, will come on to the launching of, of the new one uh, a little bit later. But in terms of what we are looking at having done, you know, it was outcomes driven, data driven, uh, and uh, you know, strongly uh, looking at the, those key indicators and proxies for quality. Obviously, it was over two stages, and there's been a lot of questions about whether or not we're going to keep two stages, and we'll come to that in a little bit. And uh, you know, very clearly, those proxies we were talking about were based around those three areas at the bottom, and of course, the very final one, effectiveness of trainees, was very definitely about grading. I've just realised I've done Richard's slide. Sorry, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem, David, at all. I think there's a general consensus as well that um, since 2012, given the dramatic changes in education that have happened since that time, if you just think about the different routes that are available into teaching now that were not available in 2012, you can get the sense of the profound changes. That the time was right for um, for a review of the framework, um, and like um, that was been has been articulated in this in the schools domain is that um, the, the 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 framework as it is now had led to some unintended consequences. So where schools were focusing on key stage or um, results or GCSE outcomes, they were doing so at the expense of really thinking about the content of what was being taught and when. And so we saw some examples of providers who were moving towards arbitrary measures around teacher standards and progress towards teacher standards without, without thinking carefully enough necessarily about the actual contents and sequencing of the training programme, be it over one, two, three, four years. Um, and the two-stage model uh, was becoming increasingly problematic in terms of um, uh, in terms of thinking about uh, who, where to apply the credit for the quality of NQT's training, for example, particularly if we were going back late in the autumn term, where a, a trainee may have uh, uh, been successful in applying for a job and successfully recruited into a high-performing school, um, and have had a, a whole term of developing their practice further um, since the end of their training uh, back in July. So um, there are a number of issues that, that, that we were aware of in terms of uh, the, the need to review and, and, and timeliness in terms of building on the work um, done to, to, to create the education inspection framework. Thanks, David. Thank you, Richard. So the context for change um, in developing this new IT framework, the, 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 the bullets on the slide really highlight what we were wanting to ensure that it did. The first one, that alignment uh, with EIF, uh, very clearly uh, HMCI uh, said, said to us that you know, we should be making sure that trainee teachers regardless of which sector they're going into, are prepared for the reality of the world in which they're going to inhabit, which I think you know, is, is difficult to argue with. But when, when we looked at what we were examining, we were looking at, as we said before, at outcomes and proxies, uh, and actually that no longer aligns to what was being looked at within EY schools and FE. Uh, and it's really important that we make sure that we are focusing on how well trainees are being prepared to teach the curriculum that they are going to be teaching. After all, schools, colleges and early year settings expect the, uh, the, the folks who come out of teacher uh, education to be well prepared to pick up that curriculum. And yes, they've got a responsibility to carry on that journey. And we'll look at that a little bit later. Um, 
we wanted to reduce that focus on outcomes and uh, we want to discourage grading of trainees and uh, we've had lots and lots of questions on that and it's no great surprise given our last framework uh, really encouraged uh, and, and sought to make sure I think really that that was happening um, but we're looking at it through through the lens you know and Richard said it's the right place to pause and think about what we're doing we were in a very different place in 2012 from where we are now and uh, when we're looking at this actually QTS uh, my overriding aim as the specialist advisor has been to, to really look at you know whether or not we are making this uh, sensible, sensible uh, methodology and really if we're saying to schools that they shouldn't be judging uh, pupils from year seven to, through, through to the end of GCSEs or from year three through to year six um, uh, uh, as a preparation for end of key stage tests or for GCSEs then really we shouldn't be looking uh, to encourage you as uh, partnerships to be grading trainees based on what is after all a summative end of course judgment and, and it, which wasn't designed to be gradiated in, in, in any way um, and actually looking at freeing you up to assess trainees how you want to assess them in a way that works for you in order to make sure that they meet QTS uh, at the end of the, the, the course or EYTS or that we're ready for a period of professional formation and uh, team. We want to make sure that trainees are, are really, as I said, prepared for that reality, the world that they're going to inhabit. And, you know, if we're not preparing them with the sustainable workload and we're not preparing them for, uh, to, to, you know, to, to understand their own mental health and, and that of others and physical health, then actually uh, we're not really preparing them for a, a long career in education. And uh, we've had a few questions in uh, prior to the webinar about how we will judge that and I think the, the, the key and I, th I think Richard goes through this a little bit later but the key really here is thinking about actually uh, you know are, are, are the processes in place making sure that trainees are uh, being prepared well for the stage they're at yes planning needs to be very detailed perhaps at the start and it will get less sooner as it goes on but we'll pick that up again a little bit later in the presentation um, you, many of you are probably very familiar with the Chief Inspector's commentary on the Ofsted research into curriculum uh, and the Ofsted research programme that was carried out to inform EIF was extended in early 2019 by HMCI. She commissioned the research and evaluation team, which Alan Passingham, who's with us, is from, uh, to do a further work on the ITE curriculum. And the emerging findings of the research programme into IT curriculum were published uh, last Friday uh, on the 10th of January and you'll be able to access this report via the link available on our next slide or uh, a simple Google search will I, I'm sure help you to find it in the .gov website. Um, essentially we want to really clarify and there's been a few questions i know around about you know what what is the it curriculum and, and alan may want to, to go further in discussing this when he's looking at research or this this may tackle it very well but essentially the it curriculum is is, is the education program the training program that you are providing for trainees and that encompasses both what happens uh, at the center what happens uh, on placements and broad, you know, broad uh, look at what happens uh, at the centre because ultimately that, that could be talk content, it could be mentoring, it could be placement learning ha happening out in, in, in schools or in, in settings that are appropriate for them to be attending, it could be webinars, it could be lectures, it could be training led learning, following up, it could be a multitude of things and many more that I probably haven't thought of at uh, the top of my head here ultimately inspectors will be uh, looking to you for uh, you know what is within your curriculum and we'll come back to how they begin to do that within our new methodology helen thank you david um oh. yes yeah, so i'm just going to give you a oh can you hear me yeah yeah sorry okay i'm just going to give you a <laughs> Thank you. I'll just give you a brief um, overview of, of some of the research findings that we have gathered from uh, the, the phase two part of the, the research. Um, 
obviously we, we started the research um, at the beginning of last year um, and we published some emerging findings uh, from that in October um, and that's focused on phase one work which consisted of uh, a questionnaire to the sector um, uh, and a literature review that we commissioned Sheffield Hallam University to provide for us um, along with our internal expertise from um, inspectors and, and the general idea of collecting that information was to help us to design a research model that we could then look to implement on the phase two research and the, the research model was effectively attempting to look at what 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 curriculum quality essentially is made up of what are the the key things that we potentially need to be looking at that gives us a a good rounded sense of whether um a curriculum is potentially working or not so so the key the, the key aim of that first phase was to uh, allow us to build a, an appropriate research model the findings from from the publication on friday are therefore the outcomes from what that research model is telling us um, um, and therefore how we can then feed those findings into the development of the, the, the new um, framework and, and that's to, to inform the framework. It's not to say this is the way it needs to be, um, but we'll allow the, the piloting to progress and develop and to, to ensure that we come up with the right things for the new framework. Um, one of the main things to note is that we identified um, a lot of strengths in uh, the IT curriculums that we, that we saw um, across the sector. Um, but also key to this were some weaknesses in quality uh, across the different part partnership types uh, and obviously wanting to get out there um, some of those weaknesses uh, to the sector. Um, can I have the next slide? Thank you. Um, so one of the main things we did get was that the data was suggesting that the research model wasn't favoring any one type of partnership over others. Um, so on that basis, that the model was working uh, both across uh, uh, higher education institutions uh, and skits and uh, teach first uh, partnerships. Um, you know, we were finding strengths um, in all of those and also weaknesses. Although what we tended to find was that the weaknesses did um, were different um, across the different partnership types that we saw. Um, in addition, the empirical evidence uh, wasn't always reflecting the judgment profile of the current IT framework. So there were some things that we were noticing that were um, uh, indicating that uh, is this is this something that's problematic? Is this something that we need to reflect on a little bit more um, going forward? Um, so obviously, quite helpful to identify some of those things. Um, uh, focusing on curriculum quality uh, also uh, gave us a sense of that um, there were some strong providers that had or required some development in a minority of areas. Um, so, so very strong partnerships, but with a couple of weaknesses that we spotted. And again, useful to, to pick up on that and to, to think about how we fit that in uh, the framework going forwards. Um, in the main, uh, what we did find was that effective sequencing of the curriculum and strong communication across partnerships was absolutely vital uh, for enabling the, the IT curriculum to blend together into a coherent experience for trainees. Um, so we're finding that the, the effectiveness of curriculum planning uh, and partnership working, how those two things come together, were very important for uh, um, identifying curriculum quality. So from our model, um, you know, we we had uh, around 22 indicators of quality that we were we were looking at. Um, uh, not all of them were actually um, particularly useful. Some of them weren't telling us much about the um, uh, what we were seeing, and obviously some of those indicators will fall out of the model as it progresses into the uh, into framework development. But of those that really were um, telling us something, um, what we got was, you know. Uh, partnerships having well-trained mentors um, appear to be uh, particularly uh, key. Uh, effective quality assurance mechanisms were, were also um, something that was uh, kept being reinforced by the stronger uh, partnerships that we were going to um, and that's making sure that you know uh, there was um, uh, things in place to identify that uh, in, in uh, placements uh, that the trainees were getting exactly what they needed and it linked nicely together with um, uh, the, the central training that was being received. Um, uh, the, the better providers, uh, the better partnerships even were prioritising the needs of uh, trainees over the needs of partner settings and were establishing that very strongly in their partnership agreements. Um, and 
they were also ensuring that trainees were going away with more than a surface level understanding um, to meet teach standards. So there was a, um, a lot of greater depth of um, what they were um, uh, being trained in and what they were learning and understanding um, than it being rushed through um, trying to hit uh, all the marks on the teacher standards um, um, and actually getting a bit more in-depth knowledge and understanding of the things that they need to take away before going into teaching themselves. Um, one of the main weaknesses we found was that it was more acute for primary school trainees um, uh, to, to, uh, to have very strong provision uh, and this was often related to the limited coverage um, that we found was being provided in foundation subjects. That's a very Thanks, quick over, overview. Thank you. Really helpful. Thank you. And I know you're sticking around for, for, for questions at the end now. And so thanks for joining us and for being around for the questions a little later. Uh, Rich, uh, no, it's not Richard. I think it is me. Uh, so engagement with the sector so far. Um, we have uh, tried to engage in a, in a wide variety of ways. We started off um, our development process probably about 18 months ago, two years ago. Uh, setting up an external advisory group, uh, engaging in some of the, the very basic principles of the framework and, and beginning to, to set our, our aims and what worked, what didn't and so on. Uh, and then uh, we've had a wide range of uh, meetings on an ongoing basis with USAT, NASBIT and ETF from the UFE uh, sector. And we have found those extraordinarily useful in order to be able to be challenged on an ongoing basis. Uh, so that hopefully we don't just get the confrontation of people say actually you know we could have helped you with this along the way. Uh, obviously periodically we, we've let you know about some of the updates uh, for the partnership update letter and those have stopped now uh, while we move forward through consultation. Uh, but an enormous thank you and particularly to those of you uh, that have been involved in uh, piloting and I can see some of you on the call today, we're involved in the piloting. Those have been exceptionally helpful in helping us to really test out and work through what's working, what, what needs adapting, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But in whatever way you've engaged with us along the way and for being here today, thank you. And uh, hopefully that, that, that will stand us in good stead for when we, we come to a consultation uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later. Richard. Yes, and I'd like to extend my thanks as well to those um, uh, certainly within the southwest region who put their hands up and, and offered to pilot. We recognise what a, a significant undertaking it is to essentially have a, a team of inspectors um, with you for the week, as it was on a, on the methodology pilot. So thank you very much from from, from me as well. Um, we're going to talk very briefly then around um, some of the piloting and, and, and what we went in to have a look at. Um, uh, we, we, it, during the autumn term, we we, con we conducted 23 pilot inspections, covering a range of multi-phase, non-multi-phase uh, inspections, both of HEIs and of SKIP partnerships, um, and in total, nearly 500 inspector days. Um, you, you, uh, in one of my earlier comments, I, I talked to the cultural change in Ofsted and the greater emphasis on research and on consultation. And we know that the EIF, when it was launched, was the most researched, the most cons uh, consulted upon framework that we'd ever done in Ofsted history. Um, and, and that commitment to that ongoing uh, debate and dialogue is, is continuing. Um, in the spring term onwards, there is another 14 pilot inspections currently planned. Um, with over 300 additional inspector days um, being being taken up in the spring term. So we, we, we're thoroughly testing out uh, the pilot as we did do with the school and FE um, frameworks um, uh, last year also. Um, we looked at um, various elements of the new um, of, of the new proposals, uh, most notably the, the new one stage model of inspection, um, the new methodology of inspection that, that David will touch on uh, more more closely um, uh, later in the presentation, and uh, and how the new draft criteria was being applied, and whether there were any unforeseen consequences of some of the proposals being being put forward. And we drew together through our own evaluations and the feedback from the providers, um, the, the findings to inform and develop the iterations of the new proposed handbook. Um, and obviously we will continue to refine uh, and shape that journey as it goes forward. 
some of the key elements that came out of the of the pilot process in autumn um, uh, four key messages really just want to dwell on um, providers fed back to us um, that they, they welcomed the collaborative nature of the piloting they felt it was a real strength of of the new inspection pro process they they engaged and wanted to engage with experts in their field in a professional dialogue that was fair but was also rigorous and provided a deeper examination of the ITE curriculum in, at its very best where you had subject expertise both in terms of the inspector and the provider it was an incredibly rich experience a, to observe and to be part of and very beneficial and valuable on both sides um, partnerships understood and welcomed the decision of the process that we took not to grade trainees as part of our inspection methodology we haven't graded lessons on inspections for some time now. And it was right for us to not consider grading trainees, which was leading to some arbitrary outcomes and processes that we'd found under the current inspection framework. And yet partnerships we did find were still heavily reliant on the grading of their own trainees as a proxy for evaluating the quality of training in the central element and in placements. So, the feedback that we had through the surveys for those pilots led to a strong agreement that the proposed framework would be much stronger without grading of individual lesson observations of trainee teachers. The third point that, that came back very clearly, both to inspectors and to providers, was that was simply too early to judge the quality of education being given to trainee teachers in partnerships. So in some cases, we found on pilots that inspectors came across trainees who had not even begun their placement based training and therefore they couldn't discuss the impact of the delivery of the ITE curriculum from the partnership suggested subject to executive board approval that a window of inspection from late January or possibly spring term to into the summer term would be much better time frame for the one type of inspection. Action. And finally, the one stage inspection model, including the preparation and the reduced burden of inspection that it, that it provides for um, IT providers and the use of focus reviews was deemed to be a much better step forward. Oh, nearly 90% agreed from our feedback that this was more effective than the existing arrangements of the two stage model. Thank you, David. Thank you, Richard. Um, so looking at what to expect, um, this, if you like, is a headline slide that we're then going to break out and look at a little bit in more detail, but in particular around the focus reviews. Uh, and th that essentially we'll, we'll, we'll look at on the next slide and it will go through what we mean by that, because it is jargon, if you like, focus review, but it is effectively our new methodology. So we'll come to that in a second. <coughs> Excuse me. We are moving away, as we've indicated, from outcomes. It's not that outcomes uh, don't matter, and clearly there will be ways of assessing trainees and ways that partnerships will continue to look at how well their trainees are doing. But rather than looking at data, we will be asking uh, partnerships uh, we propose to be talking to us about what have they got from their assessments of trainees. Now, how are you assessing? What are you getting from this? And what does this tell you? And even more importantly, what have you done with it? How has it uh, influenced your curriculum? How has it influenced your work with trainees uh, more broadly? Uh, or, you know, and it may be that some of it may be pastoral implications. Uh, so, you know, in, in its wider sense, what are we getting from this? Rather than us looking to validate it, we'll be asking what you have got from it, and then looking at what we see when we meet with, uh, with trainees and with staff uh, throughout the partnership. As Richard said, looking, we're proposing to move to a one-stage model and we'll go through, uh, we'll look, look at that uh, during the consultation. Uh, but essentially, you know, as Richard said, subject to executive boards uh, sign off and that it hasn't happened yet, but we are, are learning from the, uh, the pilots that really we think that this model probably needs to happen across the spring and early summer, but 
you know, more of that in the consultation. We're looking at having a longer phone call. Now, many of you, if not all, have been on uh, the other end of the phone call from us. Uh, when, when you get the, the, the call to say that we're coming and then the ping pong match begins. Now, in reality, there is still going to be a range of phone calls across the preparation. And we are looking carefully, and we'll come back to this when we're looking at the consultation, so keep an eye out for this in consultation about, about notification period and getting that right. But we're proposing to have a longer phone call uh, that is educationally focused. Now, I must absolutely emphasise here, it is not beginning the inspection. It is beginning to discuss with you what the context of your partnership is, to really understand at an early stage of preparation what is unique about your partnership, telling us about you know, your trainees, about your curriculum, perhaps about your staff, about how you organise it, so that we can really, uh, in terms of how you organise uh, the, the faculty or your staff that you have in and who goes out into, into, into schools to support trainees, all of those other things, the broad context and how you have made sure that you have, have uh, you know, the, the very best curriculum for trainees. And, and of course, that is going to be very different in each and every partnership that we inspect. And it's right and proper, I think, that we look at that during our preparation to make sure that we bespoke your inspection as best we possibly can. Uh, and of course, those conversations will continue when the inspection actually gets going. But this is very much about the context. You will have seen probably in the press uh, at some point last year that will be a stronger focus on behaviour, making sure that trainees have a, you know, a strong preparation in order to actually uh, you know, deal with the, the rigours of, of the class. I think when you see the handbook that actually it's probably not massively different, but what is different is the send in behaviour. Whenever we are meeting trainees or whenever we are looking at something, we are asking questions within the context that we're working in about sound and about behaviour. So, you know, for example, if it's subject based and we're looking at science, say, then we would we might be asking about how trainees are being prepared to deal with sound in science, how they're being prepared to deal with specific behavioural issues that can arise in science, which of course are going to be potentially at times different to if you are teaching uh, humanities or English. Uh, and that regardless of whether it's primary or secondary, you know, there may be specific things that crop up within those, that, in that subject. Equally, if we're looking uh, at um, uh, you know, more broader aspects, we're meeting uh, mentors about mentor training, we may ask about these areas as well. So it will be through our inspection work uh, like a stick of rock. Um, so, what are focus reviews? Um, now, you'll see here it says it's similar to deep dives. Many of you may be familiar with that terminology from the education inspection framework. Uh, we're not calling it something different for the sake of it, just to be different, but ultimately um, your inspections, as you know, are different to, to Section 5, Section 8, FEY inspections. Um, and we want to make sure that given that they, they are longer than those inspections, that these are bespoke to you because we don't want inspectors coming in to ITE inspections thinking I'm doing a deep dive and bringing that, that uh, sort of inspection baggage from another remit into this area. We want to make sure uh, essentially through our focus reviews, we will be looking at specific aspects of the ITE curriculum and remember earlier on I defined what we think of as the IT curriculum. Um, we will be looking at specific subjects, specific aspects of training and meeting a whole range of people across both the centre base and the placement base and that's in a very simplistic sense, the, 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 you know, the key elements. But of course other partnerships you know, may have different ways of organising and that long educationally focused conversation is to make sure that whatever focus reviews are agreed on and selected, that they are tailored to the context that the inspectors are working in, so that we don't make assumptions and that we don't make generic decisions, that we are tailoring it to you and to the situation that we find ourselves inspecting in. The key is about gathering that first-hand evidence, uh, looking at having had conversations with leaders 
at the center probably on the first day uh, to really build on that contextual understanding everyone being there ideally or being involved in some way in high level discussions with central staff before we go into placements to really get first-hand evidence of how the implementation it has been done centrally we've looked at and then how is it being implemented uh, through training in schools, nurseries, FE colleges, or wherever the trainings happen to be. Um, clearly, we will be meeting a whole range of staff. And as I said, uh, we will be meeting staff centrally. We always have, and we'll continue to do that. Some on the first day and some through the rest of the inspection. And, and these terms, of course, please remember that we are trying to capture this in, in, a, in, a, in a way that all of you have different terminology so we appreciate again during that long conversation if you're calling your staff something different or organize them differently that we are considering who we can meet with in your context so yes trainings and qts fine everybody has those but you know who are the staff that you have who is available who isn't available who do you buy in if you buy in the staff or the experts you have or the people that you bring into your curriculum you know if you're in a university perhaps from a different faculty because they're a world-renowned researcher in x those things can be brought in as appropriate into the inspection and um, just on that issue of nqts we'll be proposing to look at nqts but not ob observe and teach and we'll come on to, on to what we're talking about with observations uh, or, or what that looks like in the new framework a little later so um our judgment areas thinking about uh this and this of course will be in far more detail and you'll be able to trawl through this to your heart's content uh once the consultation is out but we are looking at only two key judgments now that is different obviously to the current three three excuse me three judgment areas we have it's different to offset other areas and that's uh, because we have sat down and really tried to strip out duplication. So we'll still be grading across these two, two uh, areas and across overall effectiveness. Um, but what we are trying to do is to make sure that we are really thinking about what do we actually have that we need to draw together in a criteria uh, criterion to make sure that we're really getting to the nub of it without actually having duplication or those conversations that could go well of course in the second judgment area you can't have x grade because of x in this other grade we've tried to make it very clearly make sure that there's little duplication and if there is duplication that they're looking at very different aspects of the same thing so we've got quality of education and training leadership and management and joined together with that overall effectiveness judgment so looking at quality of education and training, um, essentially broken down into three key areas, and I must absolutely emphasize that we are not expecting, absolutely not expecting you to go away and rewrite all of your documentation into intent, implementation, impact. This is a way that is useful for us to talk to our inspectors because they are used to thinking through those three aspects in terms of following a trail for inspection. But you, we will work with you, with your documentation, with your processes to really understand your context. Looking at intents, you can see that there's key areas, many of them are coming across some from the, the previous inspection framework. Uh, you know, for example, we've always looked at subject knowledge, we've always looked at class, classroom practice, we've always looked at assessments, we always look at behavior. But I think when you look at the substance of it, the fact that we are looking at this through dr drilling into key aspects of the program and actually looking at the curriculum that is going on it is quite different in its nature. Um, when we're looking at um, how uh, trainees uh, are, are taught and the assessment of, of trainees, um, actually how trainees are taught, we're very clear that the curriculum of IT does not just reside in some central lecture hall or some central classroom. It is that, that organic joining together of what happens in those training sessions, perhaps in seminars, small groups, webinars, 
all sorts of blended training joined together and then that moving into what happens out on a placement or a range of placements or learning experiences. Looking at how that is joined together, particularly through mentoring and how the mentors join that together in their conversations and those weekly or more interactions that they have with trainees. Assessment of trainees, as I said, we want to free you up to assess in the way that you think makes sense for you. Uh, you know, I've been asked regularly over the last year, should we get rid of grading of trainees? And I would say the same message again, you know, think about what you want to replace it with. You know, what are the purposes of your assessment? How can you best do this to support your development cycle, to support your trainees, and therefore to support the children and the pupils and learners that they serve? In terms of impact, looking at the development of, of trainees, you know, we want to essentially make sure that that intended curriculum that you sit, set out to give to trainees to then blend and use as they go into the real world, that that knowledge, those skills, those competencies are, are being secured, that there is that mastery of knowledge and skills, both through the planning of what it is intended, through the teaching and through that evaluation and assessment. Trainees reflecting on their teaching, really thinking about the components of what they intend pupils to master, that understanding that actually, you know, I have to have clear thought about what I'm going to teach and I need to follow that through. And equally moving away from this idea that, you know, schools should be taking an assessment and then working it backwards, breaking it down, really being clear about the fact that actually it's taking the curriculum and moving that through to the end assessment. Trainees, when they're completing the training, we want to you know, be sure that they are aware of their professional strengths, their areas for development, and that they're well prepared essentially for that professional formation for FE uh, or you know, QTLS, EYTS, and so on. Uh, and that will involve at some point within the inspection looking backwards to NQTs. But I think, uh, you know, much more conversations with trainees and with you about, about that process and how that knowledge of what's gone before has been used to further improve where appropriate the uh, course that's offered today. Um, Richard. Thank you, David. Um, colleagues, for the, for the other judgment um, of leadership and management, you'd be glad to know that actually the vast majority that is in the current content of the ITE framework actually um, uh, aligns with the leadership and management judgment under these four broad headings um, uh, under the proposed new framework. Um, we already talked to you about governance, we already talk about uh, ambition um, and how well partnership is prov providing for good and better teachers um, and uh, we're going to continue with that focus albeit with a closer scrutiny on curriculum and course content and design. I'll just uh, unpick each one of these in a little bit more detail um, and talk about some of the factors that we would likely to consider in making the coming to our evaluations. Um, for governance then, um, we will want to look to see how well schools, colleges and earlier settings are working with the provider and contributing to the strategy for recruitment, for example, the selection of trainees. We already do that in the current framework. The development of the education and training that trainees receive through their placements. The systematic evaluation of the training programme, its intent and its implementation and how they contribute to the strategic leadership of the ITE provision. Are they feeding back to the ITE partnership about what's working well and what needs to improve to get better? We will look at how the rigor of quality assurance systems, such to sustain effective and consistent teaching of a coherent and well-planned program, and how well that is integrated across the partnership particularly where they're delivering across different routes. We will look how engagement and liaison with employers helps the 
the effective continuum from initial teacher training to induction through to the early career development. You'll be aware of the early career framework and how well now that the core content for ITE now fits in and dovetails towards the early career framework development. In terms of excellence and vision and ambition, we will want to talk to you about mentoring and how well mentors benefit from an effective cycle of induction, training and feedback, which involves partners, schools, colleges and early year settings, and to make sure that the mentor can support as far as possible the intent of the training programme. We want to look at improvement planning and how well it is based on rigorous and systematic evaluation of the training programme. We'll be looking at a range of evidence for that, how well trainees are developing their learning, the professional knowledge, their expertise in classroom performance. And we'll take account of, where appropriate, the perspectives of the partnership, from surveys from employers, from trainees and former trainees, and an understanding of local, regional and national needs. In terms of selection, we'll want to ensure ourselves that trainees are ready to acquire the relevant curriculum and vocational knowledge and the teaching expertise during the course to show clear potential to meet the required professional standards by the end of their training. Some of you may be aware that workload is now part of the school FE um, frameworks and uh, embedded within the handbooks of those two different remits. Within ITE, we will be looking at how well the partnership leaders are checking that bureaucratic workload demands are avoided by partners. Unnecessary paperwork is not undertaken so that, uh, uh, so that it, uh, under the nose that relates to the immediate specific program components. We'll also look at any limitations and the under trainees understanding of the limitations of assessing pupils learning and ensuring that they do not require trainees to mark or assess pupils work in a way that creates unnecessary burdens or which detract from their own wider learning within the course programme. And finally, for equality and diversity, where possible, we'll examine where partnership leaders ensure that training provision includes placements offering diverse experiences across pupil attainment, demographics and needs. We'll look at where the partnership leaders are ensuring that training respects and teaches knowledge and application of the Equalities Act 2010. And also how well partnership leaders ensure that the partnership consistently meets the DfE's initial teacher education compliance criteria. David. Thank you, Richard. And that leads us in really well uh, into talking about the ITT core content framework. Um, as you'll, I'm sure, all be aware, that was published on the 1st of November, just prior to the Perda silence period. Um, and uh, we, we, over time, I've had a number of questions coming in about this. And I think it's really important that we just review that offset absolutely understands that this is a minimum entitlement for all trainees in England. It's mandatory, yes. But ultimately, it's not a curriculum. It is a set of content expectations, a minimum set of expectations, which many of you, of course, will already be meeting. And absolutely, inspectors understand and will understand as we go into the new framework that many of you will be going beyond that in order to meet your trainees' needs. Uh, you will have identified a range of things which are not in here that you think are absolutely important, and that is absolutely fine. Uh, Ofsted will not be looking to audit against this. What we are doing, uh, or proposed to be doing, is to be sampling alongside our focused reviews to make sure that uh, the minimum expectations are being met. We are not going to be going through all of the core core, con excuse me, all of the core core con Apologies, all of the core content framework uh, to make sure that it's it, it's all there. You know, actually, that would take up an enormous amount of time, and we're not there just to do compliance. But you know, clearly, we will sample it, make sure that the aspects we sample are there, um, and we want to make sure that inspectors 
are really clear about how you are sequencing that because of, of course because it is just setting out the content that should be there the curriculum actually of course is how that blends together how it's sequenced how it's rolled out across the year or in the case of undergraduate qualifications across a number of years um, so ultimately inspectors will be aware that on those undergraduate qualifications of course because of the complexities of major mods and minor mods, that actually uh, some undergraduate provision will not have had some things within uh, the, you know, the, the years that have already been undertaken, but we will be looking to make sure that by the end of the period that trainees have, that uh, trainees have had the experiences that they, they should, as we always would. Uh, so in some ways, it, it's just being clear you know that that we can report that that new compliance requirement is met so next steps um we will be launching the public consultation on monday the 27th of january hmci will be launching that uh announcing that but it will be live i would imagine on the gov website sometime around lunchtime i can't give you a specific time because i don't have one uh, but it will be keep your eye out uh, during the day on the 27th. Um, that will kick off a period of 10 weeks of consultation, uh, closing on Friday the 3rd of April. Um, and of course, when we go live with the consultation, that consultation will have all of the things that you're used to. It will have the, the handbook and framework together. It will have the consultation questions that we're seeking uh, your help with. Uh, and a range of, of you know, quality statement and so on. So a range of documentation that you can pick and choose from to, to look through uh, at your leisure across the 10 weeks. I would just uh, emphasize that during that 10 weeks, it's so important that you, you don't assume that everything that is published is going to stay as is. Uh, we will be looking at that feedback that we get during that 10 week block. Uh, both around the consultation questions and other feedback that we get to really think about how to shape this into an even better handbook ideally by the end of, of, of our process looking at the feedback in the round that may mean that during our spring term piloting that we are uh, experimenting with some changes now if you hear on the grapevine that uh, I, I, I hear there's, there's been a pilot down the road and they have changed X different to what was in the handbook or the consultation document again please do not assume that that means that that change will be made what it means is that we are trialing it considering it thinking about if we did make this change is it fit for purpose will it introduce unintended consequences and if it does then you know we probably won't do it and we certainly wouldn't do it in that form so the piloting during the next 10 10 12 weeks is really helping us to explore and to think further about what we already have. So I would hate for anybody to go rushing off and make huge decisions based on what is a consultation document. Um, and I think hopefully that, that that's a good thing because it shows that we're truly thinking about what we need to do uh, during that consultation rather than it being an affaire complete. In the summer term of 2020, we'll be uh, publishing the final draft of the framework um that will be published again on the .gov website and more communications about that much nearer the time uh, we've been asked uh, several times about what that means for inspections does that mean that there won't be any inspections in the autumn of 2020 i can, can't absolutely guarantee that that, that there won't be uh, as i said earlier it's subject to executive board sign off but we are recommending that it's looked at in the spring and, and the summer um, but of course, there is always the, 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 the fact that even if that was signed off, that if there was a safeguarding concern or some significant concern, that we may have to do an inspection during the autumn. But that is very, very rare. But I think it's right to say that up front. Now, uh, some, some questions. And we, we thank you for sending through all the questions, both online. And if you've got a question, uh, we'll be coming to those. And, um, I'll start off the, the questions and some answers, and Alan and uh, Richard, I'll pass across to you after each one, see if you've got anything you want to add. The first one, and I'm going through um, Sorry? No, I just said, of course, that's fine. 
Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, and I've got these. These are the ones um, that we had in an advance, and then we'll come on to the ones that we've had today. Um, will the inspection process be in two stages? Uh, I think we probably answered that fairly clearly. Uh, that would be one stage, probably subject to consultation, subject to the sign off, um, and the the NQT focus would probably come later in the inspection process rather than at the beginning, as we have got a clearer idea of what's going on currently when we want to see what's gone before and, and what's different speaking to the NQTs can give us that, that long longer context um, anything to add on that Richard or, or Alan uh, nope. no I don't think so no. No. grading of trainees um, no grading of trainees within our framework um, and as I said we encourage you to think about what you can do to better uh, meet needs rather than, than grade uh, and show trainees that those kind of summative assessments are uh, you know just the, that they're an assessment and, and not actually the curriculum um, we've had question about the English and maths proficiency now being in a skills uh, now the skills test have gone um, how will the deep dive model be applied to look at this in the IT inspection I think Essentially, the deep dive will uncover during, you know, when we're in a classroom, you know, are we noticing something that, that the trainee has weak uh, English uh, skills or math skills? Are we noticing there's a problem? That would feed into it. But other than that, we'll be looking at it through the way that we've always looked at recruitment and selection. You know, essentially, many, many of you, we will ask how you are making sure you comply with that uh, proficiency, uh, the, 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 the the key skills, uh, how you are making sure that those are met prior to the course, or how you are helping trainees to overcome any gaps that they have uh, from recruitment. But uh, essentially, you know, it's not going to become an industry in the way that hopefully it hasn't been for you in the past. Inspectors should be looking at this, uh, you know, as part of their inspection work, but not be spending hours and hours and hours looking at this. Richard, anything? No, but one of the things we would want to see necessarily is where some sort of initial uh, 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 needs assessment has been undertaken uh, by providers and how then the curriculum is adapted accordingly. So those who are just picking up on what David has said, those that where, uh, you know, uh, that uh, there are deficits in English and mathematics, what is being done about that to rectify those? But similarly, what about those that come in with with high prior attainment in those areas, with high degree of skill and knowledge, actually how are they being used and utilized um, uh, according in terms of the, the, their curriculum offer that, that is being made personal to them and bespoke to their needs? Absolutely, a good example from piloting, Richard. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a secondary example, and apologies, that, that's mm -hmm. where I was inspecting. But um, where you perhaps have science trainees coming in, and um, you've got, say, a, a, a physicist, and the physicist, of course, is you know, going to have stronger physics prior knowledge because they've done their physics degree, um, and they're spending quite a lot of time doing physics subject knowledge uh, work with the other scientists, uh, in part because the rest of them are biologists or you know, with maybe a splattering of chemists, if that's the case. Actually, how is that making sure that that trainee is getting the, the, the understanding perhaps that they don't have biology or, or biology or possibly chemistry? Um, so really thinking about how you shape that curriculum to meet the needs of the trainees so that are so important. Um, that leads us in nicely to how do you envisage the subject knowledge development of primary trainees in all primary subjects to look at and you know in, in essence it, it would be wrong of Ofsted to set out how you should be looking at that you know it's for you as a partnership to consider how best to meet the needs of your trainees. Ofsted quite genuinely has no preferred model in this proposed framework for what your curriculum looks like however Ofsted does believe it's important that partnerships have considered how you can best prepare trainees for the rigours of the curriculum within the time that's available. So, you know, if you read the research report, for example, it recognises very clearly the, the difficulties in a primary postgraduate qualification, preparing trainees in that wide range of primary uh, subjects. But clearly, you have a certain amount of time with trainees. How are you making sure 
that trainees across that foundation and set foundation subjects are being prepared well and I would expect uh, that we will be consulting on uh, during that educationally focused conversation that we may be asking primary partnerships about how they are making sure that they uh, give uh, trainees the building blocks that they need in order to continue developing within those foundation subjects of primary once they qualify through the early career framework. Very clearly we know that if you're doing a postgraduate qualification that you cannot be you know oven baked across every single subject but you should be being given the building blocks that enable you to to survive and then to flourish as you go through uh, your career um, and you know Ofsted's research found that this works uh, the, the best partnerships had considered how to use that time in order to really bring out key aspects of the foundation curriculum those uh, if you like for a better phrase those foundational elements that need to be there in order for trainees to flourish later uh, once they uh, get out into school uh, after graduating or qualifying anything else Richard on that um, the one thing I'd add there would be, and it built, it, and it just answers, I think, one of the questions uh, that was posed about whether we will observe centre-based training as well. Was. Yeah. Alan, Alan yeah. mentioned earlier about the research pointing to highly effective communication in the best partnerships, um, and a deep understanding of why why you are doing what you are doing at that particular any given point in time, first, next, um, and subsequent weeks uh, uh, in terms of the blocks of training that are, that are provided. And uh, given the, the time constraints on a one-year postgraduate course, that becomes even more paramount in terms of the careful thought being given to making maximum use of the time available to put those effective building blocks that David was talking about in place and uh, at the right sequence of activities at the right, for, for learners' needs and trainees' needs. Um, so where there's a, 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 you know, there was a question around whether we would observe uh, centre-based training. Yes, we will observe centre-based training if, if appropriate to one of the focus reviews that one there. But we would observe a centre-based training in in the part that it plays in the building blocks towards the end. Um, goal or aspiration for the training program for those trainees rather than looking at it in isolation and we would probably want to talk to whoever was delivering uh, the, the centre-based training and the trainees about what came before and what is subsequently coming after in the sequence of learning that is taking place and why that it is being designed in that way and whether it is meeting uh, their long-term aspirations and their long-term goals. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Alan, anything you want to add to that? Oh, I think Richard's clarified that really clearly. That's fine. Thank you, colleagues. Um, the next question is uh, around uh, the person says that there's been varying messages regarding observations taking place, not taking place during school visits. Um, now, I don't know where these messages have come from, um, but I suspect it may be that through the piloting that we've undertaken last term that somebody's heard that we weren't doing them and then that we were doing them. And the reality is that our research colleagues, uh, Alan uh, leading this, uh, challenged us really to think about our use and our purpose behind undertaking observations uh, during our visits to schools. And you will notice a subtle shift in our terminology, which actually really underpins quite a, a deeper change within our methodology, that we'll be talking within this handbook um, uh, really about visiting trainees teaching rather than observing. The purpose to seeing the trainees uh, we found was not about obviously the grading, so that's why we stopped really thinking about, did we need to see trainees teaching? And we always thought we probably did. Uh, but what we realised was missing by not seeing them was an understanding of, in practice, what they were they were doing. How were they implementing and blending together that work in their placement and the work that they've they've undertaken in its broadest sense through the the centre? Uh, and how was the mentor then feeding into that? So again, when we observe the mentor, the thinking is about how is the mentor helping to build on that taught curriculum? that has already taken place in, in its broadest sense. Are they aware of 
what has happened within the centre-based curriculum. Are they singing, if you like, uh, from the same course sheet? Uh, you know, or, or are they actually going off in a completely different direction and contradicting? Now, in essence, uh, those mentors may exist, but are the partnership aware of them? And how is that being tackled through quality assurance measures? If we think about what Richard was talking about earlier about quality assurance, actually, are we using the quality assurance uh, as a partnership prioritizer, tutor visits and picking up on the concerns uh, early? So that actually, there's that we are our strongest we are leaving until later uh, and, and so on. Um, but really thinking when we're in, in visiting a trainee about what is going on, how that builds on, listening to the conversation between the mentor and the trainee, talking to the trainee about the use of, of the, the talk curriculum, how that's blending together, and then what the mentors say and about the mentor training, so that we, get, we try to get a more uh, 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 sort of blended approach to understanding that part of the curriculum. Richard, Alan, anything to add? Uh, not for me, I don't think on that one. I think you've answered everything I would have said. Mm. Um, I would like to, I would like an update on things to have ready for an inspection, it says here, and what to send the team before they arrive. Um, in essence, and, and I'll, I'll also partially answer a question that we've had today about, um, you know, when should we expect an inspection? Um, you know, Ofsted, and it's always easy for us um, to say, would encourage you to just get on and do what you do best, which is preparing your trainees for the world uh, of, of teaching, rather than thinking about us. That clearly is easier for me to say than sometimes for you to, to live through. Uh, the reality, though, is that uh, the handbook will explain what you need to have uh, ready and prepared. I think encourage you not to go off and pre-prepare all that because it's things which, for the most part, you will have as part of your normal processes. And we are going to be very clear with inspectors that they should be taking the documentation and the things which you use for your normal processes, either for your board or for you know, your partnership board, you know, whoever you have internally and externally that challenges you, those things which you use either for your normal course improvement with your senior leadership team or with your, your, your board, whatever you've got, we will, we will use. And as I said, we're not going to be looking at data and taking it away and validating it. Uh, you know, said, well, yeah, you can do a said. Said will be taken if you've got one, but you can do it in any format you want. You can you know, be as creative or wacky as you want to be in terms of using it for you to secure improvement and we will use that. Um, so it's in the handbook and look at it. And in terms of when can you expect an inspection, I've given you some indication of what's going on. Um, you know, the person says, you know, there's clearly a backlog building up. The, the cycle will start again, a six year cycle will start again when the framework launches. Probably uh, it will start uh, launch in September, 2021, start in January, 2021. Uh, the fact that we are doing one stage models means that we don't have to elongate them across two terms. Bigger teams, yes, so you know we're not necessarily going to be piling through you all like a ton of bricks in year one, so please don't think that. It's not about a, a more economical model, this, it's about actually trying to focus on the right things. But um, we will be doing across the six year cycle, all providers, and we will, there's a risk assessment criteria, which I'm not going to go into just now because it's not signed off, it's not finalized. And obviously it's subject to consultation, but it will be in the handbook when it's published and you can make of that what you will about your chances of being inspected early or late in the cycle. Um, is it a good idea to break the standards, professional standards into some kind of progression model? Um, and I would say that they are high level outcomes, they're descriptors of outcomes. It doesn't give you the underpinning knowledge that you're going to require to achieve those outcomes. The curriculum provides the roots, the, uh, the professional standards provide the assessment at the end, and therefore it's essential that you consider as partnerships the knowledge, experiences, skills, the things that you need through your course uh, or courses 
that trainees will require in order to achieve those standards at the end. So in essence, progression model is fine, but the standards are not the progression model themselves, probably, uh, we would say. Anything to add on that, gentlemen? Uh, no, I think that's where we um, have seen some providers at the moment actually solely using the teacher standards as the default curriculum um, and, uh, and therefore the, and the associated problems that, that, can, that can occur with that approach. Yeah. Yeah, and we, yeah. we specify that a little bit in the research report as well. So it may be worth, if you haven't yet read the report, you know, you probably get some more context about the background for that in the, in the report. Thank you, Alan Richard. Um, will judgment still be made on, on the number of trainees uh, who start and finish the course? Um, completion rates, in essence, aren't examined in the way that they were. But <coughs> clearly, if when we come out uh, to visit a partnership and they've got exceptionally high uh, completion rates, and what I mean by exceptionally high, well, notably higher. Um, we may ask about that, what's going on, what's happened. Uh, but, you know, in essence, we, we want uh, partnerships to be taking risks, to be recruiting people who they perhaps wouldn't have traditionally recruited, as you know, is expected of you in the compliance criteria. However, um, you know, if, if there was something that linked to deficiencies in the curriculum, that meant they were dropping out, or deficiencies in the uh, the pastoral side, which we don't tend to find currently, then clearly inspectors are going to be looking at that from different angles and may get to completion rates. But ultimately, the start point is rarely going to be, I want to talk about your completion rates. It's an, out, it's an outcome of, of, of something which may or may not be a problem and normally isn't a problem. Uh, how the breadth of uh, research and education, including subject-specific research, will be managed. Um, the, the, the only thing that Ofsted's absolutely clear on, and HMCI made a speech to the Association of Science Education last week, uh, where she was talking about the ITE framework, and she made absolutely clear that systematic synthetic phonics will be expected, it will be looked at through this framework, um, and it's only right, she says, that that is the case. Given that uh, trainees are going into a world where schools are being held to account on how well they teach systematic synthetic phonics, therefore they need to be rigorously prepared in that in order to make school that schools do well. Otherwise, schools are going to be held accountable for that. Uh, and actually, if they got you know a lot of NQTs who didn't who couldn't do it, that would be a significant problem for them. Don't think there's any revelation in, in, in what I've said there. Um, other than that, you know, it's for you to draw in research that you think is appropriate, but clearly we will expect there to be a balance within that. You know, not just giving one a one-weighted view of education that this is the way to do it, or in our trust this is the way we do things and you must do it this way. You know, they're being prepared for a national standard at the end, QTS, uh, professional formation for QTLS, EYTS, they should be getting an understanding of how to flourish, whether they're going to Blackpool or uh, to Bognor Regis uh, or, or anywhere outside of seaside uh, uh, you know, area. Uh, uh, and then my mind's gone blank. Uh, Bromley, there we are. So <laughs> a third area. Um, ultimately, they need to be well prepared for wherever they go after they have trained. Clearly, there will be things that are contextually drawn in. Uh, so, for example, if you're in a, an area with a high proportion of forces in Wiltshire or uh, in, um, uh, in, in uh, the, West, the West Country, uh, where there's perhaps a lot of military around, Herefordshire, for example, then ultimately, yes, you may bring in something that is not in the core content framework. Your trainees need it because there's a lot of military families. You might cover things to do with the military families and about the facts, you know, that there's issues from deployment about mental health and so on that are specific to those schools. That is absolutely fine also. That is part of you choosing and framing your curriculum. Um, and I'll, I'll answer one more and then I'll open it up to Alan and Richard if there's anything. Um, uh, under the new OSED framework, how will the national skits be inspected? Essentially, um, th that will be worked through uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. It depends exactly on the makeup of those. Uh, but similar to the arrangements we've had previously, additional tariff could be added. 
uh, if we feel that trainees are you know in geographically disparate areas so for example if we were in Birmingham the east of England the south coast and London uh, it, we would look at the balance of where the trainees are uh, and inspectors uh, for those trainees that are geographically disparate and isolated may use teleconferencing facilities to speak to individual trainees to make sure that they are getting a good deal despite their geographical potential isolation from the, the, the sort of main hubs. Gentlemen, anything you want to add to any of those? No, nope. thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, no, all good, thank you. Thanks, Alan. Uh, question here about, um, you know, uh, the interest here in training, potential training for school-based trainers that might be uh, given to support the new developments. Um, Offset's not going to be providing training for, for individuals. Uh, clearly, we will train our inspectors. Um, but what I would say is, uh, talking to USET and NASBIT, uh, they will be providing uh, training and development uh, workshops once the framework goes, uh, once it's published finally. Uh, they wanted me to emphasize that they will not have any uh, unique uh, privileged insights. Uh, so we are not you know, telling them anything that you don't know. And if you go to their courses, therefore, you will be on the inside. We are sharing with you everything that they have. But you know, what I would say is my work with them over the past uh, you know, year, 18 months has really shown me just the benefit of those large organizations pulling in you know effective practice from around the country and, and distilling it. I think that you know is one way that you get training, but I'm sure there are a range of other ways and colleagues may may be able to share with you better uh, other ways of, of, of training that's going on. Uh, the evaluation schedule, will it be published? Yes, it'll be part of the public consultation, as I said. And uh, let's have a look at some questions that we've had in today. Um, in respect of not grading trainees, does this apply to the final outcome or more about grading en route? I think um, both, um, you know, if you choose to grade your trainees at the end, and not sure Ofsted's going to come along and say it's wrong to do so. I think uh you know why are you grading them probably because we expected you to that has been removed if you find there's a benefit to that by all means uh you know look at that think about it and, and you know put that as part of your process for the year but uh, Ofsted you know looks at the professional judgments going forward as met and not met because essentially you know it is a binary uh, but there is no criteria for the different gradients and therefore there is no national ability i think for us to to look at that with, with, with the reliability and consistency uh, alan anything from the research you wanted to add to that no um well, that was interesting to, Dave. Uh, sorry it was on, interesting Richard, i have right. do you want to go first richard yes thanks alan It was going first, Alan or Richard? Alan, I think you were going to go first, were you? Richard? I'm happy to, I'm happy. Yeah. We, we had, uh, we had yeah, interesting discussions are during the pilot inspections uh, around this notion of grading. Um, and, and one of the concerns from the providers was um, the statutory responsibility to make that that judgment at the end of an accredited course whether the, the trainee had met or not met uh, and the view that obviously they had to make a judgment around that so that was never going to go away and that, and, that, and that is still there's no appetite I don't think from the government to remove that um, uh, that that requirement um, uh, uh, but of course what we you know drawing on what David um, and Alan have said and what the research is saying is actually that we've grown into uh, this process of actually a, a graduated approach to uh, what does an outstanding teacher trainer trainee look like at the end of their training and 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 providers you know uh, saying x percentage of our trainees are are outstanding trainees uh, and all of that that comes with that so there is still this requirement to have a grade um, but it is as as Dave said a met or not met um, requirement at the end of it um, not you don't need to get any any further beyond that 
I, I, I think the, the other thing I'd add on to that is, you know, effectively, if we look back, we spent a large amount of our inspection time trying to validate and prove yes. that, you know, yes. that, that it was accurate. And actually, yes. that is time that is spent doing something that you could be doing other things. And that goes for you as well, all that moderation, all that discussion uh, in terms of getting it accurate. And, you know, it's not like it can't be got accurate, but it is difficult, uh, you know, as, as we know through the discussions we have with you during the previous during the current inspection framework. So, you know, ultimately I'd say, you know, think about about, you know, is it fit for purpose? Do you want to keep it? And if so, why? If not, what are you going to replace it with to, to meet your needs? Um, how many days yeah, I, I was uh, I was going to Oh, oh sorry, Al. Sorry, I, I was just going to add on the the observation front that it's it's just another method that inspectors can apply to get at the quality of training overall you know and that should be the focus of the observation um, um, so it's important that you know the the purpose that we have doesn't get confused with um, the, the purpose that you may have um, for your own um, internal understanding of where uh, where a trainee may be um, on the scale of their journey um, towards uh, effective teaching or not. We're, we're really, you know, should be using that methodology alongside the other um, methods of the focus review to get a good understanding of what does observation essentially tell us about the quality of the training programme. Thank you, Alan. Um, the question here about the, the, the number of days uh, for the inspection and, and clearly that's all got to be signed off by the executive board and it will come out of consultation uh, but we are looking probably at a four-day process um, taking account of the fact that we're doing it in a one-stage model and it'll be slightly larger teams but we've elongated it slightly to to make sure that the team sizes particularly for larger providers are um, are, are sort of realistic to engage with and we're still going through work to finalize that and I'm sure we'll be continuing to do so through the uh, consultation period and into um, the, 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 the sort of publication uh, which days I think that it will be very likely to be uh, Monday to Thursday but you know uh, th that as in the current handbook is please don't think that that is as red and would be as red because it will say usually and there were inspections when I first took over a specialist advisor where the call came through on a different day and it did cause some issues. Um, so not always, but it occasionally caused some folks to be very, very surprised. So, you know, I thought quite long and hard about whether it's a good idea to keep it at the same time. Uh, but it worked, it, you know, it seems to work well through the piloting, having that preparation uh, prior to it and then in, in on the Monday. But it's not to say that it won't, won't vary uh, and may change during the consultation. Um, could I just confirm that January 2021 is the intended start date? Depends on what executive board decide. They may, you know, if they say, uh, no, you've got to do them in September, which I think is unlikely given the fact that we've got evidence from, uh, from partnerships and from inspectors, but it's possible. Um, then we wouldn't be starting in September, but January 2021 is the most likely start date, I think. Um, and hem yeah, we've answered that one. I think we've answered most of the questions that we can. Um, there's a couple there that uh, that I could um, go on. Um, just ask. So there's a question there about uh, when observing um, centre-based training, will we will we stop the session and ask questions? And, and I think that would be very much. Um, so there's an interventionist approach that is undertaken on the school inspection now, um, where you might stop and ask the teacher and the, and the and the pupils about what they did beforehand and what they've done, what they've done, what they're going on to do next potentially, and talk to the teacher at the same time. Um, during the pilot phase, what we found was, uh, depending on which route it was. Um, some HEIs, for example, they video a lot of their lectures, um, and so they did not want that interventionist approach to it uh, uh, for those because the the, the recording was uh, uploaded and then it was put online for those anybody that couldn't then, and it was part of a, an online um, system. So they didn't want that approach. I think it's very much negotiated with the provider um, at the time of what's appropriate and what's, what isn't appropriate. Um, there's a question about ITE um, in, in, in FE there. Um, the work is ongoing, um, I would say, in terms of both our research and our um, and and our 
and, uh, uh, and our understanding about the different routes, it is highly complex, the arrangements that FE providers um, in terms of awarding bodies for ITE and the validation or the accrediting routes um, are very, very often unique to individual um, uh, providers, both in terms of the HEI and the FE college um, or, or provider that, that, that they're delivering for. Um, so there is, as part of the ongoing pilot work, we're looking more closely into that going forward, um, both in terms of post compulsory education training that's that's been that often is being delivered by colleges um, and and very rarely gets looked at during general FE inspections, uh, but also the the ITE in FE route as well. So that that piece of work is ongoing as part of our research and will inform our frameworks going forward. Thank you Rich and the only bit I'd add to that is that you'll notice within the new handbook that we now have the capacity to register um, uh, colleges that are validated by HEIs but in, in the past would have been under the HEI registration uh, so uh, you know if there are multiple sites but they are they are running their own curriculum and, and simply the qualification is coming from the university, uh, then we, we are able to look at that slightly differently. So that so that uh, may well be worth having a look at within the handbook if that's of a particular interest to you as well. Um, that uh, draws to a close. We're actually a minute over uh, the 90 minutes that, that we promised. So apologies for keeping you if you are looking to get away at half past. We really appreciate, as I said earlier on, your engagement, not just in this webinar or listening, taking the time to listen to this webinar if you're uh, downloading this later uh, or listening to it again, uh, but we really appreciate it and we really, really genuinely encourage you to, to you know, take part in our consultation uh, launching on the 27th of January uh, and uh, we look forward to making this uh, you know, the, the very best uh, Ofsted ITE framework uh, in Ofsted's history. Thank you very much and thank you to Richard and to Alan uh, for uh, joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone.